Ecclesiastes, uh, verse 1. These last few chapters of John, really starting last week and then this week, uh, John 12 and John 13, all the way through, are really the last couple weeks of Jesus' life on the earth. Seems like the, 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 the whole, almost the whole half of, back half of the book of John is around one week in the life of Jesus and a day or so, but... It's amazing that so much is packed into that. And uh, to me, I think it's important, you know, when a person is, you know, going to die and they have a chance to say something, their words seem to have an emphasis. You know, it's like like your last, the last things you want to say, the last things you want to leave with someone before you go. And that's kind of what uh, is happening here. In John 13, 1, it says, Before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come. You'll read through the book of John and other places where they, it says that Jesus slipped through the crowd because his hour had not yet come. And it says that a number of times through the Gospels. And what he was talking about was the hour of his death. And he's saying here, the hour is now here. It's ready for him to depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own. That's really a neat way to say that God is love. Jesus came to show the love of God. And one of the things it says about him before he's leaving is he loved his own who were in the world. He loved them till the end. And then verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. You know that Jesus was given a name above every name because he humbled himself. God exalted him into the heavens and gave him a name above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. All authority is his. Everything is given to him. Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his outer garments. Now, you know the story. Jesus went now to wash the feet of the disciples. But I love the fact that he is saying, I want you to know who's washing your feet here. It's the one who has everything, the one who's the greatest of all, the one who's in the highest authority. There's no one greater than Jesus, no one more powerful than Jesus. A name above every name. All things have been given to his hands. And yet he takes this, this role of kneeling down at the disciples' feet and washing them. Now back in those days, it was, a, it was a sort of customary for a person who was having a dinner in their house that they would come and they would wash the feet of the people because they walk around all day in dusty roads with sandals and they would just wash their feet. It was a, a way of showing hospitality or kindness or some courtesy. But that was often left to the servants. You know, it was like, oh, you're the servant, go clean everybody's feet here over here. And it was amazing to the disciples here that Jesus would get up and actually take that role. It's, it should be amazing to all of us that Jesus would take the role of a servant given who he is. Everything belongs to him. He's God Almighty in the flesh. And yet he takes this role of a a lowly servant. So it says he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his his waist. And then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And I'm going to Skip the interaction with Peter there. But basically, Peter didn't want Jesus washing his feet. No, Lord, no, 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 no. He knew who Jesus was. Remember, a little while ago, Jesus said to Peter, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, you're John the Baptist or one of the prophets, somebody like that. But who do you say I am, Peter? And Peter said, you are the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father so, so Peter had a true revelation of who Jesus was. And he, I'm sure he felt like, what are you doing washing my feet? And Jesus 
obviously convinced him through his conversation that he should wash his feet. Once Jesus uh, convinced Peter, Peter wanted his whole body washed. <laughs> that guy was all in or all out. Well, you know, he was just like really into it. Oh, you mean if I don't have anything to do with you? Well, wash everything then. Here I am. But in verse 12 then it says, When he had washed their feet and put his outer garments back on and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? And that's what I want to talk about today. Do you understand what I have done to you? Well, when Jesus asked that question, it seems to me that maybe there's something a little deeper than just washing feet, because that's an obvious question. Do you, but he said, he didn't say, do you see what I've done, or do you like what I've done? He said, do you understand? Do you comprehend? There's something I want you to capture in your heart because of what I've just done here. And uh, verse 13, he begins to explain what it is that he did. He said, you call me teacher and Lord, the Lord, and you are right, for I am this. This is who I am. I am teacher and Lord. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, what does he say next? You also ought to wash one another's feet. So think about this. Jesus is preparing to die. He's about to turn over the work of his kingdom into the hands of these men. They're going to be sent by Jesus into all the world to preach the gospel. In a few short weeks, he's going to say to them, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. But I think before they're being sent, there's some things he wants them to have in their heart as sent people. It wasn't too long before this, if you remember the story, these guys were walking down the road and they're arguing about who's the greatest among them. These were the men who were going to take the message of Jesus around the world. They were vying for position. The one mother came to Jesus and said, Lord, I have one request. What is it, ma'am? I want my two sons to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left when you come into your kingdom. So they were looking for position. They were looking for power. They were looking for notoriety. And Jesus came to teach them a lesson here. I want you to understand what I'm doing here. If I am the Lord and the Master, everything is in my hands. And if I have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. Now, I can imagine, I, I'm just, I'm, this doesn't say this in the Bible, but just kind of thinking through this, I wonder what these guys were thinking there. I wonder if Peter was looking over at John like, I ain't going to wash his feet. <laughs> Look at them things. <laughs> but these guys were, you know, they were against one another in a sense, you know, fighting for these positions. And all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, I want you to wash each other's feet. There has to be a humility that comes into your life, a servant heart. If I'm going to send you, I want to send you as a servant. I don't want to send you with the, the mentality you have right now. And so it's these, these last few days, some of the most important words of Jesus. And he says, I want you to understand what I've done. He gave them a great example. I am, I am the greatest of all, and yet I've taken this lowliest spot. And so you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, people do foot washings. That's fine. But I think that Jesus is after a lifestyle of a servant. I can, I can go over there right now, Jenny, and wash your feet. I see you had no shoes on. <laughs> and say, well, that's done. Check mark. But Jesus is after this heart, isn't he? He's after... Something in these men's hearts. It's not just the act of washing of feet. It's the heart of a servant. It's the life. You know, Jesus, who is the Lord, became this servant. He's saying, hey, I want you to do the same. Wash one another's feet. 
For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. How many of you are followers of Jesus? Well, he's given us an example. He says, I want you to do just as I've done. And sometimes it's hard for us, even us, who are followers of Jesus, to take on the heart of a servant, to take that lowly spot. You know, it's what Jesus is after. Do as I've done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. What's he saying there? Well, he said, you call me teacher and Lord. If he's the Lord, we're the servant. He said, I want you to know there's no servant who is greater than his master. Anybody here greater than Jesus? That's what he's saying. There's nobody greater than me. And if I, who am the greatest of all, have done this, then you who are the servants should do the same. Follow my example. Servant is not greater than his master. I have left you an example that you should follow in his steps. I wonder if, if there is in us, in me, in all of us, this heart to wash feet. When I say wash feet, I mean, I mean if you want to literally go around and wash feet, I mean, if the Lord tells you to do that, go do it. But just having that heart that says, I'm a servant. But look what he says there. I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. I, I would have to say, if the body of Christ is representative of things I've seen and maybe even walked in in my own life, that there's times maybe we think we're greater than our master. We're better than that. I'm not going to take that role. I'm not going to wash those feet. Let somebody else do that. We are not greater than the master. But then look at his next sentence. Nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Jesus is about ready to send these people in his name, with his authority, to go into all the world. I mean, I mean they are the beginning of the spread of the kingdom of God. And he's saying to them, I want you to know that you are the messenger. And in a short while, I'm going to send you, but you are not greater than the one who's sending. In other words, you're to be more like me. If I'm the servant, you're to be the servant. So what, I'm, what I want to kind of talk about in the rest of this chapter is I, I believe that Jesus is giving these men some last words to prepare them for being sent. You know, it's kind of like, okay, Lord, Father, I'm coming to be with you. Look at these guys. I just yelled at them for, you know, how they were arguing along the road. They still doubt. They still have fears. Their, their faith is still weak. And so I'm going to give them some last words of encouragement here before I go. And so that's really, to me, what he's doing in John 13. He's trying to take and, and just cut to the root this pride and arrogance and, you know, seeking to be better than somebody else or looking for that position. He wants to cut that to the root of our life so that we are, we are humble as Jesus Christ. We are willing to serve. We are willing to give our life for the work of his kingdom. I don't want people serving me. I mean, I know pe we, we all serve one another. We do that. And there's times that you have to be on the receiving end. But I hope that we have a heart to serve. And if it's not there, then maybe today you need to just pull aside in a time of prayer with Jesus and say, Lord, I'm not greater than you. I am not greater than you. And if you, my master, have done this, I want to do the same. Show me how. Show me how. Show me the feet you want me to wash and begin to do it. He'll guide you there. A servant is not greater than his master. 
nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So I'm going to talk today uh, five points or five lessons. I call them lessons, whatever. Five lessons for those that are being sent. And guess who's being sent? See, it's not, not just, well, I know there's a missionary couple. No, it's not that. Everybody is sent. When Jesus gave us the Great Commission, he said, go, that means I'm sending you. Whether you go across the street or go next door or go to Zimbabwe, we're all sent. We have a commission, the Great Commission. Jesus has sent all of us, and so this is for those who are being sent. Don't you know the messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. So as a messenger of Jesus, I want to make sure I don't act like I'm greater than the one who's sending me. He's left me an example to follow his steps. So what's the first lesson? Well, it's humility. We just talked about it. It's humility, considering others better than yourself. The second lesson, verse 17 Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. How many of you know there's a big, huge gap between knowing something and actually doing it? It's a huge gap. It's easy, I think, for whatever reason, we, we here in our country, in America, we seem to equate knowing something with walking in it. You know, you might walk up to somebody and say, hey, I think we should pray more. Oh, I know that. (laughs) Uh, We should be witnessing to others. Well, yeah, I know that. I know those scriptures. We should be loving our enemy. Oh, yeah, I know that. And somehow, because we know it, or maybe we memorize the scripture, or we could quote it, or we maybe could even teach it in a (laughs) Sunday school class, doesn't always mean we're doing it. And so if you're going to be a sent one, which all of us are, don't you think it's important for those who are sent to be doing it? Jesus came to do the will of his Father. That's what he lived for. My meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's what he lived for. And we who are sent are not greater than our master. So he said to them, Okay, so you understand now. You understand why I wash your feet. You understand that I'm giving you an example, but you are blessed if you do it. Knowing about it really means nothing. Actually, knowing about it is self-deception. Jesus taught one time that if a man hears my words and doesn't put them into practice, he's like a man who builds a house on sand. And when the pressures of life come, that house will come crashing down. But if you hear my words and you put them into practice, then you're building on a solid foundation. There's still pressures that will come to your life, but your house will stand. So the second lesson about being prepared to be sent is you got to be committed to obedience. Why is that a word that we shy away from? We're not talking about walking in the law. We're talking about obeying the words that Jesus gave us. That is what the Great Commission is, isn't it? Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. I wonder if we are setting up ourselves or our children or people that we disciple for failure. Because we give them understanding but don't have the follow-through or the accountability to say, hey, are you walking in that? If you think about it, Christian counseling at its, at its root is helping people to walk in obedience to the Word of God. It is trying to take a person who's experiencing some issue in life, whether it's in their marriage or finances or with their kids or whatever it may be, and you're trying to discover, wonder where this person walked away from the path of obe- obeying Christ. And you try to urge them to say, hey, come back here. Come back over here to obedience. 
This is where Jesus has called us to walk. Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them not to know, but to obey. And the church, our church, church in America, will be weak. It will be weak until we commit to obedience. Commit to it. And say, no matter what the cost, I want to obey my Lord. He's the Lord. He's the master, isn't he? So his, his words were, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The third lesson is found in verse 18 through 21. I'm not speaking to all, of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place. That when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. He's talking about Judas, who would betray him, really in a short time from here. And Jesus pointed them to Scripture, didn't he? The third lesson I believe that we need if we're going to be a sent one is confidence in the reliability of Scripture. I mean, we, we have a great... I, I, don't want to, I don't want to call it a fallback, but... It's kind of like our, our, our question when we have issues in our life is we should say, what does the Bible say? What does the Word of God say about that? You know, if you're searching for answers in your life for direction, what does the Scripture say? If you're seeking direction for your children or your marriage or a friendship or anything, say, what does the Bible teach? What is God's Word on this subject? And I'm telling you that if you would take that seriously, it will find stability in your life. And so he says here, I'm telling you about this time. Judas is going to betray me, basically. And I want you to know ahead of time, before it takes place, that you may believe. He wanted them to have confidence in the scripture that this thing that's going to really shake them at their foundation, they don't have to be shaken because scripture already spoke of this. It's a prophecy and it will be fulfilled Yes, you won't like it when it happens, but I want you to be confident that the Word of God is true. After these things, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. That must have come as a shock to these men who have walked together for those three years, three and a half years. But I want to I want to take a, just a little bit of a break from these these five lessons I've given you three of them, and I want to talk about to me what what became almost the most radical truth in this chapter. I want you to read it with me, and I want you to think about it. Verse twenty. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. Think about that for a minute. He's sending them. He's sending us. And he says, whoever receives the one I send receives me. Do you believe that? I hope you do, because it's in the Bible. <laughs> what does that mean? If somebody receives you, they're saved? No, if they receive Jesus. If they receive you, they receive him. It's kind of like an ambassador. We are ambassadors for Christ. If you are an ambassador and you go into another country, if they receive you, they're receiving the country that stands behind him. And Jesus says... That's why it's so important about who are these people who are being sent? What's in your life? Because if they receive you, they're going to receive me. Jesus sent his disciples in, in Luke 10 and Matthew 10 ahead of him into the different places he would go. Maybe he was saying, if they receive you, they'll receive me. If they don't receive you, kick the dust off your feet and move on. But there's this, there's this thing about preparing a way for those who want to come to Jesus. And as if they receive you, they'll receive me. I wonder if we're living a life 
in such a way that people can receive us. If people receive you, there's a chance they'll receive Jesus. If you're, you know, <laughs> I want to use the word butthead, but if you're, if you're kind of that way, thinking you're doing this in the name of Jesus and nobody ever receives you, what, what chance is it they're going to want to receive Jesus? They're going to say, oh, that's them Christians. Them crazy Christians. Now, I'm not saying you compromise. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying you need to have humility. You need to have a commitment to obedience. These things that Jesus is saying, they prepare the way. They prepare for the, the way for you to be a sent one. And when you go with this heart, when you go with humility, you go with a life of obedience, and these other couple things I'll share with you, it's kind of like people can receive you. And if they receive you, the door's open. I mean, Jesus is just right here. If they receive you. That's a, to me, that's a phenomenal statement. He who receives the one I send receives me. I couldn't believe it when I read that. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me, and that's the Father. Isn't that awesome? That, now, when I read that, I feel like I really want to be a good sent one. I don't want my life to hinder a person receiving Jesus. I want it to, I want it to enhance that. Somehow, I want people, when they meet me or they meet you, that they receive us. They receive you. There's something in their hearts as I receive you. And because of that, the door is open to your friend, Jesus. If you receive Jesus, you receive the one who sent him, his father. It's a beautiful thing. But it puts, it puts a little bit of a, I don't, want to, I don't want to say the word burden, but in a way, it is. If you go around with, with, a, with a rotten attitude every day, always rebuking your neighbor for something, and he's an unbeliever, who, why, why would you expect him to live as a Christian? If, you, if that's kind of how you're carrying on in life, people are going to have a hard time maybe receiving you. So, think about that. That's a beautiful scripture. Whoever receives the one I sent... And I want you to just read that for a minute and put your name in there. Whoever receives Kirk receives me. Whoever receives Ted receives me. And if they receive me, they receive the one who sent me. It's a beautiful scripture. I, maybe you could cut it out and stick it on your mirror and read it in the morning before you go out. Say, Lord, I want to be the sent one. I want to be a sent one that people can receive. Now, they rejected Jesus, and they will reject you. And they executed Christians, and they will execute, even in our day, people are being executed for Christ. So, not everybody will receive. But if they receive you, there's an open door to Jesus. John 20, verse 21, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We are the sent ones. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Look at John 17, verse 8. I have given them the words that you gave me. So think about this. Jesus is here. Father's in heaven. Jesus said, I only say the things the Father gives me to say. I only do the things the Father tells me to do. So here he is. Um, I have given them his disciples here, the words you gave me. The Father is speaking. Jesus is speaking the words of the Father, going into the ears of the disciples. And he says, and they have received them. See that? I've given them the words you gave me, and they received them. There was an open heart to receive. Not everybody received them, but these have. Lord, they've received the word. And they have come to know in truth that I came from you. You see how that receiving of the word opens up an, a revelation, an understanding of something of God. They have come to know the truth that I came from you 
and that they have believed that you sent me. It's a beautiful scripture. It takes, takes some time to spend with that as well. Number four lesson. What is it that God wants from a sent one? Little children, I'm reading in chapter 13, verse 33 now. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Not just love one another, right? But love them as I have loved you. A servant is not greater than his master. Love them as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And look at verse 35. By this, by what? The love. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples. How many of you want people to know that you're a disciple of Jesus? Love. Love. And so I'm getting ready to send you guys. I want the whole world to know. So love one another. It's a message in and of itself. Love one another. They will know that you're my disciples. So the fourth thing that needs to be in the heart of a sent one is this love. The love that's just like the love Jesus showed to us. It's not I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back type of love. It's a love that just constantly gives. The fourth or the fifth lesson, verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus said, will you lay down your life for me? <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. Well, The fifth thing, I think the Lord deals with this in our life as we yield to him, as we obey him, as we follow him. I believe he, yield, he leads us to this place where we will totally surrender, so, totally surrender, even to the place of laying our life down. Peter wanted to do that here. He wasn't able, you know, with the story you know, Peter was there at the, the fire, and one lady said, oh, you were one of his disciples. I don't even know him, you know, and he denied him three times. But later on, Peter did give his life. Later in life, he did. He followed that same path where Jesus was going. You might say, well, that means he went to heaven. Well, sure, it means he went to heaven, but he, he got there through execution, and Peter walked in those steps. Is Jesus calling you to martyrdom? I don't know. But if he is, are you willing? You know, the question we got to ask ourselves, where, where do I draw the line in my willingness to follow Jesus? I mean, we can't get down and wash someone's feet, guaranteed. When you stand before that king and he says, fall down and obey, obey me or I'm going to throw you in a furnace, you're going to fall down and obey. That kind of commitment kind of grows daily. You don't walk in disobedience to Jesus and all of a sudden have the ability and the boldness and the courage to stand in front of some king and deny him the chance of falling down to worship his idols. You know? And so Jesus prepares us because, you know, he told his disciples when he sent them out, I'm sending you like lambs among wolves. That doesn't sound cool, does it? If you're a sheep farmer, you don't send your sheep out among wolves. But he does. Sends them out. Because there's others that need to be saved. There's others that need to be won. And it's going to cost some people. Not everybody becomes a martyr. But a lot of people did. If you read through the book of Acts, read through church history, a lot of people did. But are you willing? That's the question. Maybe our prayer is, Lord, please don't take me down that path. 
And Peter said, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay my life down. He was willing. But he had been walking in this path with Jesus for some time, laying his net down, following his commands, doing what he wanted. You know, all the time just following Jesus day by day, learning to obey, learning to respond. And now here it is at the end. He said, Jesus, if that's the road you're going, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, you're not ready right now. You know, this night you'll deny yourself. But I wonder if we are willing to let the Lord do whatever it is he wants to do in our life to make us willing to lay our life down, if it comes to that. I'm not trying to be morbid here today. I'm just, I'm just talking about the reality of what we see in the Word of God. And whether you want to believe it or not, I mean, in our world today, there's people being martyred all over the world because of Jesus. You know, we, we happen to be living in a country where that's not happening. But in other parts of the world, it's happening. And if we're going to be sent ones, sent as a lamb into a midst of wolves, then it means there will probably be, there'll be casualties along the way. But it's okay because Jesus not only went to the cross, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, amen? And that's where he's going. <laughs> that's where we're going. If you follow him, that's where you're going. 2 Corinthians 5.14, I'm going to close with this. Second Corinthians 5.14, it says, The love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ controls us. Does it? The love of Christ controls us. I hope it does. I hope it does. I hope that that would be the cry of your heart, that the love of Christ controls us. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all. Who's that? Jesus. Therefore, we've all died. In a way, when you become in Christ, you die. You know, our life, our old life basically is gone. We die because Jesus died. One has died for all. Therefore, all died. You should look at your life as before Christ, the, you know, then salvation, and then after Christ. Your B.C. days and your A.C. days. Before Christ, after Christ. And, I mean, there, there should be a change. Because we died. Verse 15 he died for all, that those who live, so here we are, we're living, we died, but we're living. Isn't that strange? What died? Well, that old life, that old life that was separated from God, that life that was prone towards sin and rebellion and all the other things. I've come to Christ, now love of Christ controls, controls us. The love of Christ controls us now. He died that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. Anybody that's on this side of the cross should have this as a focal point of your life. I no longer live for myself. Why? Because I died. He died, we all died. That we should no longer... He died... You know, we always talk about how Jesus died for our sins. Yes, he died to take us away from the wrath of God. Yes, he died to take us to heaven. Yes, but he died that those who live might no longer live for themselves. It's another reason he died. That's what life on the other side of the cross is. No longer living for myself. I live for myself over here. Look where it got me. I came to Jesus. I died and yet I live, but I'm living not for myself, but for him, for him who for their sake died and was raised. 
In verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. We all quote this scripture, talk about it. It's just you know, kind of part of our psyche as a Christian. I'm, I'm a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. It's true. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. That old, it's dead. The new has come. What is the new? I no longer live my life for myself. That's the new. The old has passed away, the new has come. That's why there's such a radical change in a person's life when they come to Jesus. Because the new has come. I no longer live for myself. Something has changed inside of me. Now verse 18 says, all this is from God. All what? Well, that old life passing away, the new life coming. It's from God. Who could do that on their own? Could you walk down the road and say, you know what? Today I think I'm going to be born again. Today I think I'm going to renew myself and I'm going to be a different person. No, that comes from God. It's a miracle that comes from Him. This is from God who through Christ reconciled us to him. It required Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross, being buried, raised from the dead. It's through Christ that we are reconciled back to God. Isn't that amazing? And, and I hope that you're thankful for that. I hope that you can say, Lord, thank you that I've been reconciled to you. But it doesn't end there. God doesn't want us to rejoice in the reconciliation. Look what he says. It says, through Christ, he reconciled us to himself, and we will all rejoice in that. We praise God for that. We sit in worship services, and we thank God for the reconciliation. And we read our Bibles because we want to know him, and we pray because we want to develop that relationship. We want to be close to him. We want to know him. But that's not where it ends. Why? Because he is sending he is sending. I'm calling you to myself that I might be with you and I will send you forth to preach. That's what he called the 12 for. But you see what it says here? Through Christ, he reconciled us to himself and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So not only have I been reconciled to God and I thank him for that, now all of a sudden I've been sent. I've been given, and you've been given. Anybody here who's reconciled to Christ? How many here are? You have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Well, I'm not a preacher. You are a preacher. Well, I haven't gone to seminary. These guys didn't go to seminary. I never went to seminary. What are you doing up there preaching then? I don't know. We're all called ministers. Everybody in this room, if you're reconciled to Christ, you have been given a ministry. You might say, well, I work in the nursery ministry. That's great. Praise the Lord for those who work in the nursery ministry. But you've been given another one. Well, I'm on a worship team. Hallelujah. But you've been given another one. Well, I don't, I'm not in a ministry yet. I'm still trying to get my life together. Okay. But you've been given a ministry, even if you're trying to get your life together. You remember the guy that was the, uh, he was possessed by the demons, and Jesus delivered him from the demons. <laughs> and the guy says, Jesus, I want to travel with you and go with you where you go. Jesus said, no, go back and tell your family and friends the good things the Lord has done. You know what happened? He was given a ministry. That guy was just... Deliver from demons. He didn't know anything. All he knew was Jesus did something in my life. Here's who I was before. Here's who I am now. My old life has passed away. I'm now living for him. That's all it takes to be sent. That's all it takes to have the ministry of reconciliation. I have been reconciled to God. Now he wants me to help you get reconciled to God. 
Now, you're sitting here and you're saying, well, I don't want to be involved in an evangelism program. You're involved in an evangelism program. <laughs> you may not have realized it, but you're already in it. It happened the day you gave your heart to Jesus. Because he's not about just reconciling us. He's, he is about reconciling us, but he's also about sending us. And so he says, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And look how he describes this. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Now, we can believe that, can't we? In Christ, here's Jesus walking around. In Christ, God was reconciling the world. He was saying the words of God, doing the works of God. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. We all have no problem with that. We can see it. We read the stories. We understand it. It says he was not counting their trespasses against them. But then it says he entrusts... <laughs> entrusting to us. Entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. How many of you would entrust... Look at your neighbor right there. How many of you would entrust that person with the ministry of reconciliation? Well, Jesus did. He has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. If they receive you, they will receive me. We are ambassadors for Christ. Look into what the next verse says. God making his appeal through us. See, God was in Christ reconciling the world. Yeah, amen. God is in you reconciling the world. Did you know that? That God is in you reconciling the world to himself. Every one of you, if you've been reconciled to Christ... He say, now I want to live in you and reconcile the world to myself. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Isn't that a beautiful scripture? So Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He said, do you understand what I'm doing? I'm preparing you to be sent. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I'm preparing you to be sent. I'm going to be leaving in a short time. The servant is not greater than the master. Be humble. Humble yourself. Walk in obedience. Happy are you if you do this. Have confidence in the word of God. It will never allow you to be shaken. Love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. And how, how great is our love and our commitment to you, Lord? I'm willing to lay my life down. Willing to lay my life down. That's what he was doing on that day. It wasn't just about washing feet. It was washing feet to be sent. The beautiful feet. Amen? So let's all stand together. And... Uh, Maybe ask the Lord today, which of these five lessons do you really need to walk in in your life? Maybe it is to be humble, to take on the role of a servant. Maybe the Lord is saying to you, hey, why don't you take your Christian life and bump it up a notch and walk in some obedience. Don't just learn about it. Start doing it. Start Start applying the, the truths that you're hearing. You know, live in them. Maybe you don't have confidence in the Word of God. Well, how much time are you spending in it? The entrance of His words give light. Read the Word of God. Jesus opened up the minds of His disciples to understand on the road to Emmaus. It's not just, a, it's not just an intellectual pursuit. It is putting these words in front of you and letting the Spirit of God enlighten you and give you understanding, God will do it. 
Confidence in the Word of God. Loving each other. Maybe you're, maybe you're having a hard time with that. Well, we're to love as Jesus loved. The servant is not greater than the master. Next time you have a hard time loving somebody, say, Lord, I think I'm greater than you. Because that's really what's happening. None of us would want to say that. I felt really weird even saying that right there. But sometimes it's how we, that's how we approach life. And, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever. Lay my life down. They, when they told the Apostle Paul that bonds and afflictions await him on his trip to Rome, he says, none of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear to myself. I want this one thing, and that is to complete the task that he's given me. That's it. What if we lived our life that way? What if we said, the only thing I want to live for, all I want to live for, is the day I can retire. No. All I want to live for is the day I can stand before him and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have done what I've asked you to do. What if we all made that commitment today? And I, I sense fear rising up <laughs> all over the room. If you're afraid, let me see your hand. No, I'm kidding. Why don't we just challenge ourselves with that? What are we afraid of? How many of you believe that the, the plan of God is the perfect thing for you? It's the perfect thing. It may not fit into your agenda or what your hopes are, but it is the perfect place to be. Can you trust him for that? 